So she picked herself up and looked around. She was in the middle of a dark forest. There was hardly any light, but a little bit of moonlight trickled down between the trees and fell to the ground. And she looked ahead of her, and on the path in front of her she saw the paw print of a bear. And she knew it was the paw print of Valamon, the white bear king. She put her hand into that paw print for a moment and held it there. And then she stood up and put her foot in that paw print. And ahead of that print she saw another, and she put her other foot in that paw print. And so she began to walk. She walked all night through that dark forest as the moonlight trickled down between the trees, as the wind whistled and whispered through those trees. It was hard going, and she had to be faithful to his paw prints in the ground, had to search for them, sometimes feeling with her hands to find them, looking to see where the light caught them. So she went forward with all of her senses, with her smell and with her hands and with the taste in her mouth, she walked through that dark forest, following the trail of Valamon, the white bear king. And after a long while, it seemed the sun was about to come up and she lay down under a bush and she slept. When she woke up, the sun was high in the sky, and she was hungry. But she just kept walking through that forest. After a while, she found a blackberry bush, wild blackberries, and she ate everything on that bush she could find. How long was this journey? Days, perhaps? Or weeks? Some say it took years. It was the kind of journey which makes you older. The kind of journey which deepens the questions in your heart and makes the music of what you are sing louder and also quieter at the same time, sing more broadly. So she went forward and she had never been as cold as she was on this journey. She had never been as hungry as she was on this journey. Towards the end of a certain day, the sun began to go down, and she was still in a dark forest. And she looked ahead, and she saw the light from a window. So she walked towards that light, and she came to a house, a small house in the wild forest. And she knocked three times on that door. And an old woman opened the door of that house and said, Hello, young one, hello. Where are you going at this time of day? And she said, I am seeking Valamon, the white bear king. Oh, said the old woman, and perhaps you are the one who was supposed to marry him. Yes, she said, I am. Well, he passed this way some time ago. He was going very fast. I don't think you will be able to catch him. But you can spend the night here and rest up a bit. You need to rest, I think. So she went into that house, and she was welcomed there. And the old woman had some soup on the stove, and some bread, and some cheese. And by the fire there was a little girl playing. She had a pair of golden scissors. And she snipped them in the air, and as she did so, cloth came out of the air itself as though the air was a loom and it was making the fabric right there. And the fabric was of many different kinds, silk of different colors, green and purple and black and red. Wool came out of the air as well, all kinds, anything you wanted, it seemed, came out of the air there into the lap of the little girl playing by the fire. And they all ate dinner together. And that night, the youngest daughter, the princess, slept in that little house and in the night she dreamed. And the next morning the sun came up and the birds sang in the trees and she prepared to go. 
But as she was standing in the doorway and saying goodbye to the old woman, the little girl came rushing up to the doorway, clutching the golden scissors in her hand. And she said, Granny, let's give these scissors to this woman, because it seems she has a long way to go. Yes, my child, the old woman said, let us do that. So the little girl gave the golden scissors to the youngest daughter, the princess, and she put them in a pocket of her dress, and she thanked them and said goodbye and turned and began to walk. So she walked on through the forest of our lives, through the forest of her life, through the forest of this world, that dark and wild place where everything flourishes according to a law that speaks and sings inside its own heart. And she heard birds wilder than any she'd heard before on that day. And she heard the screech of wild animals in that forest. And she journeyed a long way until finally that forest became a prairie. She entered a region where there was not enough rain for trees to grow. But there were long grasses. Sometimes they were over her head. She walked through this whispering place where the grasses were. And after a long journey, she came to a hut that was there amidst the grasses. And she stopped and she knocked three times on the door of that hut. And an old woman came to the door of that hut, and she said, Ah, young one, where are you going at such a time of day as this? The sun's going down. Why are you out here in the cold and the wet? And the youngest daughter, the princess, said, I am seeking Valamon, the white bear king. Ah, said the old woman, and perhaps you were the one who was meant to marry him. Yes, she said, I am. Well, he passed this way some time ago, moving very quickly. You know how it is with bears like that. He was just a flash going through the forest. He's off to the glass mountain where he must marry the troll hag queen. But you, my dear, you can spend the night here. Be welcome here in this house and rest up, for you will need to rest up. You have a long journey ahead of you. So she went into that house. And there the old woman gave her food of many kinds, and there beside the fire there was a young girl. And this young girl was playing with a golden bottle. She had her dolls set up there by the fire, and each doll had a little teacup. And the girl poured out of that golden bottle marvelous things. Into one cup she poured lemonade, into another she poured hot chocolate, into the third she poured Turkish coffee. And a while later, she poured other things out of this bottle, this golden bottle. Magical fluids and liquids and drinks of all kinds came out of this bottle. So the princess spent the night there. She ate with the old woman and the young girl, and she slept in that little hut, and at night she dreamed. And the next morning, she got ready to go, and as she was standing in the doorway, the little girl ran up to the doorway and clutched the bottle in her hands and said, Granny, let us give this bottle to this woman, for she has a long journey ahead of her. Yes, my child, she said, let us do that. So the little girl gave the golden bottle to the princess, and she put it in a pocket of her dress and thanked them and turned and began to walk through the grasslands. And the grasses swished and whispered around her, and they opened and they shut like doors. But after a long journey, she came to a place of stone, where there were many boulders, many small hills she had to scramble over. And ravens cried in the sky, like the hinges of doors opening and then shutting far off. And the wind blew cold of that air bit into her bones in a way no other wind had done ever before. And at times she thought about the warm and beautiful castle of Valamon the White Bear King. And at times she thought about the warm and beautiful castle of her parents, the king and queen. 
But still, she followed the trail of Valamon, the white bear king, through the world, through over those stony boulders and those hills. And finally, she came to a hut that was made out of those boulders, nestled up against a small hill. It was twilight, the sun was going down. And she went to the door of that hut and she knocked on it three times. And an old woman came to the door and said, Ah, young one, what are you doing here? What are you doing here out at this time of day? And she said, I am seeking Valamon, the white bear king. Oh, you are, are you? Well, he passed this way some time ago. He's gone up the glass mountain to marry the troll hag queen. And perhaps you were the one who was meant to marry him. Are you my child? Yes, she said, I am. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But come, come into our hut and be nourished. Be welcome here. So she went into the hut. And as before, as in the other huts, it was a beautiful place, warm and filled with comfort. And there was a little girl playing by the fire. And she had a tablecloth. And she was doing amazing, magical things with this tablecloth. And in fact, when it came time to eat, the old woman said, Come, come, my child, come. And the little girl came to the table, and she spread the tablecloth on the table and whispered a few magic words. And food appeared on that table out of nowhere. Out of the thin air it came, out of the narrow and scrawny air it came, these full dishes of food, bread and cheese and meat and wonderful drinks and all kinds of things. Beautiful, delicious food was there. So she enjoyed this food, and she was nourished in heart and body and in mind by that place. And she slept the night in that hut, and as she slept, she dreamed. And in the morning she prepared to go, and the little girl came to the doorway and said, Oh, Granny, let us give this tablecloth to this young woman, for she has a long journey ahead of her. Yes, my child, let us do that. So they gave her the magic tablecloth. And she stuffed it into a pocket of her dress, and she turned, and she began to walk. And there were boulders around her, and there were hills. And the landscape was hilly this way and hilly that way. There were valleys and gorges to climb through, and narrow rivers slashing through the rocks. And at length she looked far ahead, and she saw a glimmer of light, like a star down on the earth. And she walked towards that light, and it got bigger, and she saw that it was indeed a mountain made of glass. And the sunlight went into this mountain, and it bounced in this way and in that way. It danced through all the glass of that mountain in an ecstatic way that it spangled and sparkled its light out into the world. She was almost blinded by this light as she approached. But as she came near, clouds covered the sky. And she saw a little house right up against the base of the glass mountain. A house made of stone and wood, but a house that was in a ramshackle state. The roof had several holes in it. It was not a sweet and beautiful house. It was a hard-pressed house up there against the shoulder of the mountain. But it was late in the day. The sun was beginning to go down. The ravens were crying in the trees. So she went to the door of that house, and she knocked on it three times. And a woman came to the door, and she had a careworn expression on her face, and she wore a gray dress that was torn in many places. And behind her in the house, there was the crying of children. There were seven children there, and they were all crying in this way and that way. And the woman said, Hello, my dear, hello, what are you doing here? And the princess said, I'm seeking Valamon, the white bear king. Oh, he's hard to find. He's gone up the glass mountain. He's at the top. Soon he will marry the troll hag queen. But you've had a long journey. Come, come into this house and be welcome here. So the princess went into the house, but it was a bedraggled house. And there were holes in the roof and in the wall, and the wind came whistling through those holes. 
And then the woman of that house, the mother, she took a pot and she put it on the stove. And this pot was filled with water and it was filled with stones. Why are you boiling stones? The princess asked. Well, my children are very hungry, as you can hear. They are crying out because of the pain in their tight and twisted bellies. And so I boil stones here, for we have nothing to eat. And if I give them these warm stones for a while, they can put them in their mouths and imagine that they are apples. And for a little while, they are free from the pains of hunger, which trouble them all the day long. Well, as soon as she heard that, the youngest daughter, the princess, wasted no time, and she pulled out the magic tablecloth and the golden bottle, and she poured amazing drinks out of that bottle, and she made amazing food come out of the narrow and scrawny air of that place into that room. And the children ate and ate, and so did the woman, and so did the princess. And they were all very satisfied and fed in body and mind and in soul. And when they were finished eating, the woman said, So, my child, tell me, are you the one who was meant to marry Valamon, the white bear king? Yes, she said, I am. Ah, well, it's a hard thing, that. It's a hard thing. This life brings us many troubles. And what are you going to do now? I don't know, she said, but I am seeking Valamon. I must go to where he is. Well, that's a hard climb, she said. You must go up this mountain. But I have an idea she said. My husband is a blacksmith, and when he gets home, let's speak to him. Perhaps he will find some solution to this problem. So after a while, her husband did come home, and they talked to him about this, and he said, I have an idea. I will work on it this night. You all sleep. I will go to my workshop. I will get some things done, and in the morning, I think I will have something which will help you. So the princess slept in that house for the night, and everyone in that house slept. The children slept as they had never slept before, after having a good meal in their bellies, and the mother slept as well. And in the morning the sun rose, and the blacksmith came. He had been working all night in his workshop, and he had some iron bear claws, four of them, and he gave them to the princess, and he said, Put these on your hands and your feet, and then climbing that mountain will be much easier. Thank you, she said. Thank you. And she said goodbye to all of them. And she put those bear claws onto her feet. And she put those bear claws onto her hands. And she approached that mountain, shimmering, glimmering there in the light of the sun. And then she put her hands and feet against that mountain. And she began to climb. a hard climb and the wind whistled around her as she climbed and below her that little hut pitched there at the roots of the mountain it got smaller and smaller and soon she was in the realm of the birds. And her feet ached, and her hands ached, as with those iron bear claws she climbed up the side. And soon she was in the realm of the clouds. But she persisted. She kept going up the side of that glass mountain. As the sunlight streamed down and bounced and laughed and sang its cackly bright song inside that mountain. Well, who knows how long it takes. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it takes only a moment. How many seasons passed? Seasons that seemed like nothing at all. Well, it was the blink of an eye, and it was the time it takes to build seven cities. And it was autumn and it was winter, 
And it was summer and it was spring. But after a while, she came to the top of the glass mountain. And there was grass up there. And there were trees. And she looked, and there was a wide field there covered in grass. And there were people there, and they were setting up a tent, a beautiful festive tent that was purple, and it was gold, and it was green. And she went to them, and she asked, What are you doing here? What is this place? And they said, We are preparing for the great feast, the great wedding, the great ceremony, when Valamon, the white bear king, is going to marry the troll hag queen. Ah, she said. And when will that be? That'll be in three days' time. Ah, she said. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. And she looked around, and there were other folks around there setting up tents and getting ready. Tables were being built and set up. And far away at the end of this field, she saw a large castle, a castle that seemed to be made out of thorns and broken glass, a bristly, brambly castle there, beautiful in its way, but stark and combative as well, a brutal and beautiful thing it was, like a great claw there of rock and stone, this castle. And she walked carefully towards this castle, across the grass, walking past the people setting up their tents and getting ready for a great feast, a great celebration putting streamers on poles and lights in the trees, things like that. And she came to this castle, and she saw there was a wide window in the side of it. And she went to this window and sat down in the grass in front of this window. And she took out the golden scissors, and she began to play. She snipped those scissors in the air, and she made fabric come out of the very air linen and muslin and wool and silk of all kinds. She played just as the little girls had played. She played just as that white bear Valamon had played with the golden wreath. She toyed and played with those magic scissors, singing to herself a little song. And then suddenly something swept aside a curtain in that window, and then something opened that window, and it was she herself, the one. It was the troll hag queen, the radioactive, toxic-breathed mollusk of this world, the bat-brained thing she was, the claw-shaped thing, the toxic queen of all things evil and beautiful, and shards of darkness seemed to be around her and in her dress, and the earlobes of dead bats were in a necklace around her neck, and her eyes were fire, and her skin was old ashes that have been rolled under the sea for a thousand years and she looked and she said oh what is that oh that's good oh hey i like it i like it i like it what is that you have there and she said oh this is you know this is just some golden scissors i have that's all oh yeah yeah but they're good stuff that's great what do you want for it huh? you want some money some stuff what you got i'll give you some gold i got lots of gold lots and lots of gold oh well you know i won't sell these for gold no, no, actually no amount of money can purchase these golden scissors. But there is one thing I would exchange for these scissors, and that is a knight in the same bedroom as Valamon, the white bear king. Oh, honey, well, that's uh, yeah, you drive a hard bargain, but those scissors are pretty cool. All right, all right, all right. You can spend a night. It's all right. You can spend a night there. Just give me the scissors. Give me, 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 give me. So she handed the scissors over to the toxic radioactive queen of us all, the shadow princess that she is. And she said, oh, these are great, great, great. I love them. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And disappeared into the depths of the castle. And later that day, the princess was led by the troll hag queen through the corridors of that castle to a bedroom. By this time, darkness had come, and the stars were singing in the sky in their old and ancient way. And she said, There it is! Go in, go in, you can go, it's all good. And the princess opened the door and rushed into the bedroom, and there was Valamon himself, in his human form, fast asleep on the bed. And she went to him, and she cried, and she sang, and she said, Valamon, Valamon, and she threw herself on him and embraced him and cried tears of joy. But he did not wake up. He was sound asleep. It was like he was a stone. And she shook him, and she sang, and she yelled, and she tried to get him awake in all kinds of ways, but she failed. 
He was stone cold asleep. Sleeping there he was in a deep, deep sleep. Nothing she could do could wake him up. So she despaired and she cried and her heart was filled with grief. And after a while she slept as well. Well, day came and the birds sang in the trees and the sun came up. And on this day as well, preparations were being made for the great wedding, the great feast. And again, the princess went to the castle and again she went to the place outside the window there and she sat down in the grass and she took out the bottle, the golden bottle, and she began to play. She poured into a glass some beautiful lemonade and she drank it down and then she poured some beautiful uh, white wine into the glass and she drank that down. So she played with this golden bottle in a beautiful way and she sang as she played with this golden bottle. And after a while, someone, something, the creature, it, the queen of us all. She opened that window and she said, Dang, what you got there? Oh, I like that too. I like that too. You got lots of tricks, Missy. You do. What is that thing? And she said, well, it's, you know, it's just a golden bottle. That's all. Oh, yeah, but it's great. It's great. I got a lot of people coming for this big thing I'm having. They all want to drink all kinds of stuff. That is just the thing I need. That's just the ticket. What do you want? You want gold, pennies, gold, silver bars, anything, cash, bonds, stocks, you name it. I got it. Well, she said, uh, actually, money will not uh, buy this at all. I'm not interested in money. But there is one thing I would accept in exchange for this golden and quite magical bottle. And that is, a knight in the same bedroom as Valamon, the white bear king. Oh, oh you little snake-brained little waffle iron of a princess, I don't know. But all right then, all right. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can have it. All right, sure, let's make a deal. It's a deal. All right, now give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. So she handed the golden bottle over to the troll hag queen, who disappeared into the depths of that castle. But later in the day, when it was time to sleep, she led the princess through the corridors of that castle to the royal bedroom. And she went through the door, and there once again was Valamon, asleep on the bed in his human form, sleeping a deep and profoundly peaceful sleep. And again the princess yelled at him and spoke with him and shook him and tried to wake him up in about a thousand different ways, but nothing worked. And at last she succumbed to grief once more, and she wept and she cried and she wailed in that room. And she remembered the golden wreath, and she remembered the beauty of Valamon when he was awake and alive and moving around and speaking, and she remembered the beauty of his castle. And finally in that place she slept. And in the morning the birds sang in the trees, and the sun rose. And the princess left that bedroom where Valamon was sleeping and walked out into the world, the grassy places there outside that castle. And she walked all day around that place, lost in her own thoughts. But the thing is, there were some carpenters staying in that castle. They had been summoned there to help construct and get things ready for the great ceremony, the great wedding, and the great party. And they had heard the crying of the princess in the night. So that day they went to Valamon, the white bear king, and they spoke to him, and they told him that they'd heard this crying in the night. And he heard this, and he took this deep into himself, and he thought to himself, something must be going on, something must be going on. And he remembered the drink he had been given every night by the troll hag queen, the little drink to help him sleep. And he began to question this and think about other ways to move forward and other things to do, he began to strategize. And so the princess wandered through the grasses there during the day, and after a while, in the afternoon, she came to that great window of that castle, and she spread out the tablecloth, the magic tablecloth, and she made food appear on that cloth. Yes, there were all kinds of breads and cheeses and fantastic foods. The smell was just amazing, and she ate some of them for a while, and she sang to herself as she did this, and suddenly the window opened, and there she was, bang, like the great minus sign that she is, the great soulful negativeness that she is, the great cavern of doubt that she is in shadow and hunger, the growly queen of all growls. Nah, what is that thing? I gotta have that thing. That tablecloth is pretty good, pretty good. You got a lot of stuff missing. How much do you want for that table? Tablecloth. And she said, well, this tablecloth isn't actually for sale. Yeah, no, m money. I, I don't want money for this tablecloth. But there is one thing I would accept. 
and it is this. A single night in the bedroom of Valamon, the white bear king. Oh, you still want that, do you? I still want it, want it. Well, it won't do you any good. No good at all. It'll be like sawdust in heaven. It's nothing. It's garbage. No, no, but I don't know. I, all right, all right, all right. I'll make a deal. Just give me that tablecloth. I got a lot of people coming. They're going to be hungry, hungry, hungry. Give me that. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Okay, she said. All right. And she handed the tablecloth to the troll hag queen. And she took it and disappeared into the depths of the castle. And that night is every night the troll hag queen gave Valamon a magic drink to drink. But remembering what the carpenters had said, this time he questioned that little drink, that magical drink, and he found a way to pretend to drink it, but actually to spit it out into the corners of the room there. And he lay down as if he were asleep, but in fact he was not asleep at all. And the troll hag queen stood up and was about to go. But something seemed not quite right. Something smelled wrong about the situation, about the moment in her life that she was in. And she turned and looked at Valamon, and she asked herself, Is he really asleep? Is he really asleep? And she took her two obsidian knitting needles out of her bag, and she went towards him, and she looked at him carefully. She looked at his beautiful body there and his arms, and then she took the knitting needles, and she plunged them into his arm, just like that. And he did not cry out. He pretended he was deep, deep into an enchanted sleep. She looked at him. Well, he looked like he was under a spell. She took out the obsidian knitting needles, and away she went. And she got the princess and said, Come here, missies, all yours, all yours, go ahead. So the princess went into the bedroom and closed the door behind. And there was Valamon, and she went to him, and she wept, and she cried, and she embraced him, and this time he wept and cried as well. And he opened his eyes and looked at her, and embraced her in his human form. And there was great sweetness in that room, and they rejoiced in each other's company. And they each told their stories of how they had come to be in that place. And she told him of all her journeys, and he told her of his journey as well. And after a while, in the depths of the night, as the stars looked down upon that thorny castle and that place at the top of the glass mountain, the two of them in that little room began to think and to plan. And then they slept. Well, the next day the birds sang in the trees and the sun rose, and it was the day of the wedding. Yes, indeed. But before that wedding began, Valamon went to the carpenters, and he spoke to them, and he thanked them for what they had told him. And he spoke to them and said some, a certain few words to them. And they nodded and said they would do what Valamon asked them to do. And then there was a great sound of music. Horns were blown. Great beautiful horns come from the sea. Beautiful sea music rang through the air there. And the musicians played. And the court poet read a fantastic poem about barnacles underneath the sea and old mosses and stones. And then the troll hag queen dressed in her finest clothes. Beautiful scarves made out of dead crabs. And antlers from deceased beasts from long ago were all on her sides. And a necklace of dead mice heads and things like that, just beautiful things. And she got ready for the wedding, and she was going to proceed at the head of the wedding procession. There was a little parade. And you should know that this mountain was built in this particular way. There were two peaks at the top of this mountain, and there was a wooden bridge going from one to the other. For the church where they were going to be married was on the far peak there. So they all got ready, and they began to walk across the bridge with the troll hag queen proudly and darkly in front and Valamon following behind and then the wedding procession with the musicians, all the lords and ladies of that place many of them singing and the musicians playing and the wind whistling and whispering around them and she stepped out onto that bridge, the troll hag queen, and she walked proudly, strongly forward, and the wind blew, and suddenly there was a great crack, and the bridge cracked into two pieces, and she fell down away from that bridge, down and down into the darkness below, far down to town, the side of that mountain, and she was gone. And as the great cry of the troll hag queen faded and died away in the air, the hairs on Valamon's body began to disappear 
All the white hairs, the beautiful bare fur, began to disappear, and the human he was began to appear there. And when that cry was completely gone, and there was only the silence of the air and the wind whistling around them, Valamon was there, and he was a human man, and he was beautiful. And Valamon turned to everyone, and he spoke and said, We must have a wedding today, but today I will not marry the troll hag queen. No, I will marry you. And he spoke to the princess, and he said, You are the woman of my heart. So let us be married in this place. If you wish it, we can be married here, right now at the top of this glass mountain. And she looked deep into his eyes, and she said, I do desire that. Let us be married here. And there was a joyous wedding at the top of that glass mountain. All the food was prepared, and the musicians were ready, and there were the words were said, the beautiful words binding together a man and a woman forever in a beautiful pattern that they could not have conceived of before either of them met the other. And when that ceremony was over, when that ceremony was finished, Valamon, the white bear king, and the princess, the youngest daughter, began walking away from that glass mountain. For there was a secret passage down the center of that mountain. There was a much easier way to go than climbing down the side. So the two of them set off down this circular, spiraling stairway, down and down, into the heart of the mountain, and they came out at the bottom. And he was in his human form. And the two of them walked across the stony, bouldery countryside. And they came to the hut where she had stayed. And they visited with the people there. And it was revealed that in fact that little girl was her little girl. Magically whisked away, perhaps by the troll hag queen, to that desolate place. And so the two of them walked across the countryside. And they came to the prairies the places of the long grasses, and there they found the little girl there in that hut and took her with them as well. And then they came to the deep forest, and there there was a hut as well where she had stayed, and they visited there, and they took that little girl with them as well, for that was her little girl. And then all of them went through the forest, back to the castle of Valamon, the white bear king. And messengers were sent out far and wide that there would be a wedding, a second wedding ceremony in that castle. And the princess's family came, her mother and father, and her sisters as well. And there was a grand wedding in that place, a beautiful wedding, as beautiful as the wing of a swan floating on quiet water. And afterwards there was a grand celebration. And comedians came from Australia. And they told jokes that had funerals inside them. And crumpled up old love letters inside them that, when set aflame, made a great fire and a warmth which shone in the eyes of everyone there. And magicians came who could turn coconuts into bowling balls and bowling balls into doves that flew up into the air above everyone there. And geologists came who sang and played the bagpipes and explained the old story of the earth to everyone there. And I was there too. And I was given a little silk ribbon. And I was told if I took this silk ribbon and brought it here and showed it to all of you, if you all touched this silk ribbon even for a moment, you would gain the ability to breathe underwater and to know secret things. But on my way here, that silk ribbon was lost. Yes, I don't know how it happened. Somewhere in the baggage claim area of the Pittsburgh airport, perhaps. Or at gate F12, where I spent three hours eating crummy old Swiss cheese sandwiches. Somewhere there, it slipped out of my luggage, and it is no longer here. So I do not have that silk ribbon to show you. I do not have that magic to bring you, but I do have this story. Keep this story well in your hearts. May it live well there. May it open for us like the blossom on a tree that none of us knew was there. May we 
be sheltered by that blossom. Thank you for listening to this story. Thanks for listening to this story. And as always, I invite you into this story. Uh, the door is open. Don't let me get in the way. Uh, find a place in this story which gleams and sings and sparkles for you or uh, annoys you like something uh, caught in your foot, you know, some stone in your shoe. And uh, notice that stone in your shoe and take it out and look at it and see what the story has to say. I'm struck by, in this part, by the way in which the princess, the youngest daughter, becomes like the bear. I love the bear claws. She puts on rusty, you know, iron bear claws. That's great. It's so physical. And the image of her climbing up the side of the glass mountain, wearing those bear claws, wow, that's packed with information. Huh? That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. Just keep that in your heart uh, somehow. That princess climbing up the glass mountain wearing iron bear claws. So strange and so beautiful at the same time. So she puts on the claws and she becomes like Valamon, the bear king. But then I notice also the way in which she uh, becomes like him towards the end. She uses his strategies she's learned from him. Uh, she plays with the uh, magical things she's been given, the golden scissors, the golden bottle, and the tablecloth. Now, of course, she saw the little girls do that as well, and that's very beautiful as well, knowing that they are her, her daughters, right? Um, and that also feels true to me. Parents learn from their children. In a way, children remind us to play, or even if you're not a parent, you know, you see kids uh, laughing and playing in the... Um, most unhappy circumstances sometimes, you know, airport rest areas or wherever, parking lots. But they're able to see the joy in things. They're able to play, um, whether it's joyful or not, they're able to play in wild places. Um, so she learns from that. But, she, but also Valamon, of course, was the first sort of character in this whole story who showed some playfulness. Because there uh, in the meadow, in the forest, he played with the golden wreath. And what a beautiful image that is, right? This, this powerful being, this bear, which, uh, you know, should we remind ourselves? Sure, let's remind ourselves. I mean, I worked in Yosemite National Park, so I had some small experience with bears. And, of course, I had to explain it. I had to explain it to people. Um, but bears, you know, who can peel open a car door with their claws, right, from the top, who will... Uh, go into a car for an apple core who have amazing powers of smell, right? 
So there's the story of the apple core in the back seat of the car, and the bear peeled open the door, uh, got into the back, used its claws to shred the back seat, and dug out that apple, and then uh, couldn't find the way out again, actually, so shattered the windshield and went out through that way. Um, amazing. I've never seen anything like that. That's just a story, but it's one of many stories like that about bears in Yosemite, uh, which is a sad situation, really, if you want to go into it, of how the humans and the bears interrelate. But needless to say, bears are powerful, but also sensitive, right? They can smell, they can inhale, and they can know uh, numerous square miles of forest just from the smell in their noses. Amazing. But they're strong and powerful. So to see that early on in the story, Valamon playing with the wreath is just a beautiful thing. He doesn't come in as a powerful being. He comes in as a playful being. That's the first time we see him. And then he's powerful when he uh, gets through all the king's uh, knights and soldiers, of course. But anyway, uh, I'm just reminded of that when she plays with these magical things in front of the window of the troll hag queen's castle. And it is through play that she entices the troll hag queen. It, it, you know, words just can't um, describe the elegance of this pattern that this story is laying out for us. It's like a dance. It's like a, some sort of mandala written in sand uh, that arrives with the spoken voice and departs again. You know, the troll hag queen is now, in a sense, like uh, the princess in the beginning who saw the bear playing. And now the roles are in some ways reversed or like a spiral. It's just a higher level of this same pattern because now the princess is playing with those magical things and the troll hag queen is watching. The troll hag queen, who, of course, is in every way the opposite of the princess, the princess who is open minded, willing to um, go with wild ideas like, hey, I'm in love with this bear. Let's get married with a bear. Sure. The troll hag queen who's just hungry, hungry for gold, for money, for things like that. Again, there's the parallel of Valamon in the beginning says, you know, she tries to buy the golden wreath. The princess does. She says, oh, my parents have lots of money. She's coming from a realm of money and of getting stuff, which is the realm the troll hag queen seems to inhabit. And the princess says these words at the beginning of the story. What can I give you for that golden wreath? What can I pay you for that golden wreath? And Valamon says, this wreath is not for sale. This wreath is only for sale, actually, if you give me you, yourself. I'm not looking for money. I'm not looking for some sort of material symbol of wealth. I'm looking for you because you are true wealth, as are all of us, perhaps. So at the end of the story, here we have the troll hag queen trying to buy these magical things, the golden bottle, the golden scissors, the tablecloth. And it is now the princess who once upon a time tried to buy a golden wreath with money. And now she is the one playing with a golden thing, uh, the bottle, the scissors, the, the tablecloth, and saying to the troll hag queen, uh, these are not for sale. They're for sale only for one thing. And that is a night with Valamon. I love it. It's just sparkly, that, that resonance between those moments. It's an amazing pattern. And how often in our lives have we been on one side of a situation and then later found us, ourselves on the other side, right? And that's in some way what we need to do to really grow past a situation, you know? Um, you know, you, you get together on the bench in the park and you're the one saying, this isn't going to work. It's not working for me. We need to break up. Our relationship is done. And the other person is heartbroken, right? And then five years later, there you are in a different place in a restaurant and you're the one hearing the words and the words come from the other person. This isn't going to work. It doesn't work for me. This relationship is over. We should break up. Just to use one example, a romantic example. Uh, for my own life, uh, in my own life, gosh, well, yeah, I've been in both of those situations, of course. And if I had not, I would not have grown in the way I needed to to get past that level to the next one. But uh, jobs, right? I once worked for Greenpeace and uh, the environmental organization and did many things. I wasn't really employed by Greenpeace in this particular example, but um, I was you know, chanting in a demonstration around a building and you look inside and there are all the 
men mostly with neckties on, looking down from the Minneapolis Grain Exchange, like a stock exchange for grain in the in the whole Midwest region, looking down at us through the glass at the demonstrators with their signs. And I was one of those people, and I was rallying, you know, for a good cause. And then fast forward, whatever, 10 years, was it 10? I got to do the math, at least 10. And I'm in uh, New York City in a giant skyscraper, uh, and outside there are protesters in the streets in red shirts chanting. Uh, yeah, so I got to be on both sides of that as well. So in the same way, I think that's how that's one way we grow, is by seeing a situation from both sides and going, ah, this is what it is like to be rejected. This is what it is like to reject someone. This is what it is like to betray someone. This is what it is like to be betrayed. And so the princess in this story experiences these moments from both sides. And now she is the one playing with these magical things outside the window of the castle, the troll hag queen's castle. So I love those moments. And then we get Valamon, who is asleep and must be woken up. He was pretty conscious earlier in the story. He seemed to know what was going on. He certainly knew about the Troll Hag Queen and all that stuff, and the princess did not. But now, um, and she was sort of in the dark, right? Literally in the dark, using that candle to see, what's this thing beside me in, in bed at night? Is it a human man? Is it a bear? What's going on? She was in the dark, and by seeking greater enlightenment, by seeking greater knowledge with that candle, she nevertheless caused the magic of the moment to, to run away. And she graduated to a deeper level of trouble. Yes, that's what life is. We go to a deeper level of trouble, a higher level of trouble, whichever way you want to go. And so at the end, now she's the one who's sort of more fully conscious. She knows the entire situation. She's aware of things he is not. Uh, she is there, for example. He doesn't even know that. And uh, he's going to get married and all that. And so she's the one waking him up out of unconsciousness and uh, failing until the third night, of course. Um, so that seems very resonant as well. We seek enlightenment. We seek wakefulness, right? We seek, we want to be awake. And uh, finally, of course, she succeeds with the beautiful help of the Carpenters, wonderful minor characters, which are so real and helpful, right? There's other people around, you know? It's not just the two of them. This isn't a story just about them. It's happening in a community in the world. And there are people like carpenters who sometimes, well, not sometimes, who can be very helpful, right? They heard the crying. They heard the weeping. And because of that, uh, good things happened. Valamon was alerted and all that. So this is a lovely story. And um, I should say, of course, that it uh, comes, its ancestor is the, the Greek story of Eros and Psyche, uh, which uh, is a story from about 2,000 years before. And it's just a marvelous example of the way stories move and blossom and change. Here it is showing up in the 19th century in Norway. Uh, this was written down uh, in Norway um, in this particular version. But it's clearly influenced by that earlier story of Eros and Psyche. And it's not like one is better than the other, one version. They're both different branches on the same tree. But uh, clearly it has something to say to us. It has had something to say to us because it survived so long. People felt it was worth keeping um, because it says something, I think, about relationship. Bringing home a bear to your parents. I mean, it seems kind of crazy. You could say cartoon-like to have a girl marry a bear. But if you've ever brought home a uh, romantic partner to meet your parents, well, uh, hey, it can be kind of like that, right? Um, there's a bear in the room all of a sudden. How does that work? What's going on? What is, how does he eat? Does he shave? Is there hair everywhere? What's going on? The uh, new romantic partner can be kind of feel like an alien or can be seen as some kind of alien by the family welcoming them. So these animal marriages are um, metaphor, but they are also a way of seeing, a way of seeing uh, in the world and a way of feeling in the world. And perhaps you, dear listener, have been in this story somehow. 
And aren't we all? Aren't we all in the story? Whether we're the troll hag queen, I was the troll hag queen yesterday. I'm going to be Valum on tomorrow for about five minutes. And then I'll be the middle daughter on Tuesday for a while. And then I'll be the king trying to, you know, trying to buy a wreath, you know, trying to make a wreath with the workmen. That's a great detail, too, huh? The king tries to uh, make a wreath that will match the one in her dream, but she doesn't relent. She remembers her dream and does not let go, which is a beautiful thing. If she had settled, imagine that. If she'd been like, well, those wreaths, you know, they aren't as great as the one I dreamed of, but they're okay. This is the world, you know? It's filled with, you got to manage, you got to make do. And so I'm going to make do with this wreath my dad had made for me. What if she'd done that? then the whole thing would have not happened. And uh, yeah, how often we do make do, when in fact we should perhaps remember the golden wreath, which is circular and eternal and of the other world and has magic about it. May we all remember the dream of the golden wreath that we have or the dream of whatever it was we had like that. May we all remember our dreams and not settle uh, for the lesser imitations, the plastic imitation. May we all be awake when we must be awake in a joyful way. May we all confront the big evil of this world through playfulness, a fierce playfulness which makes new things blossom. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are uh, more stories on my website, which is jleeming.com, J-A-Y-L-E-E-M-I-N-G.com. Thanks very much to the Patreon supporters who've helped make this possible. I like to make these stories free and available to everyone who wants to hear them, um, but it does cost some money for hosting and stuff like that. So I appreciate that. If you can join them, that's a wonderful way to support this type of work. These stories are ways to see the world. And we we need them these days. And they speak to our whole selves, not just to our minds. Uh, They're like the dreams of humanity, right? The dreams of human culture, the dreams of community. The community dreams a dream and it becomes a story. So thank you for listening to this and uh, take care.